Good evening. My name is Councillor Gary Crawford, and I am the chair of the Budget Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to call this evening's uh, meeting to order and welcome everybody. Today's meeting is being held with members of the Budget Committee participating by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting via video conference. The public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. These measures, of course, are necessary to comply with public health guidelines and to prevent the spread of COVID-19. <coughs> I ask for everyone's patience tonight uh, as we probably will experience a few techni technical difficulties as we already have in today's session, so just please be patient. Members, please remember to keep your mic muted and your video turned on while we hear public presentations on the budget. And I'd like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and the videos turned off. It'll make it easier for me as the chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the meeting. And if there are any visit visiting members of council, again, I encourage you to also turn on your video so we know that you're present and people can see you when they're doing the deputations and along with questions. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. First order of business, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, we can proceed. Purpose of this meeting tonight is a special meeting of the Budget Committee to hear public speakers on the 2022 Capital and Operating Budget. We have a number of people who have registered to speak to the Budget Committee over the last day, uh, this morning and this afternoon, and members of the public are connected to this meeting by phone and computer. Again, speakers list is online at toronto.ca slash council. You can click on the speakers button to see who the speakers are and when you may be up in the um, in the timeline. For the public who are speaking tonight, here's how the process works. I will um, acknowledge you, um, your name. Staff will unmute you and then you'll have five minutes to speak to the committee. After that, please stay online because there could be some questions from any committee members or visiting councillors. And after that, you can stay online if you want to listen to the rest of the meeting. The clerk has also received emails and communications from the public about the 2022 budgets. Those communications are available to members on CMP, which is the clerk's meeting portal. Of course, I do encourage the public to send their comments to the budget committee throughout the budget process by emailing buc at toronto.ca. Tonight, as we have all day, is the public's opportunity to speak about the budget. It's an important part of the budget process. Last week, we heard from <clears throat> staff and all the agencies and divisions. Uh, today, tonight, and all day tomorrow and tomorrow evening, we'll be listening to you, the public, on your opinions and anything you want to talk about about the 2022 budget. Budget Committee will be meeting two more times, um, ending on January 28th and February 7th to make our final recommendations that'll go off to full executive committee and then from there it'll go off to full city council for debate and decisions. Members, are there any questions we need answered at all? I think we're pretty clear and straightforward. So why don't we begin uh, with the first speaker? Again, what I'll do is I will name off the, the first three uh, speakers just so you know where you are in the order. First speaker tonight is Vincent Puhaka. After that, Tim Kokur. And then after that, Riley Banyanpa. Why don't we start with Vincent Puhaka? Sorry, Mr. Chair, to interrupt. Vanessa, oh. Con Vanessa Conley is on the line and is connected to the meeting. Sorry okay. about that. No problem. Then we'll do Vanessa after Tim. So anyway, Vincent, welcome. You got five minutes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Just making sure that I'm still audible. Is that right? You can be heard quite well. Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Um, and just want to say thanks, uh, Councillor Crawford, because you got my last name right. And I would say probably 60 to 70% of the time people don't get it right. So good job. Um, so my name is Vincent. I'm a member of TTC Riders and have been for many years. Uh, most of you probably have heard from me before. Uh, I do try and keep these deputations a bit different uh, each time around, but uh, we'll see how well I do. So we at TTC Riders do have a number of concerns surrounding the budget. Uh, myself, I'm going to be talking about service. If you want to call it the TTC's core product, uh, you can. So I've seen the updated January ridership numbers, or rather the numbers that were released uh, this month that you've used to update the TTC budget. So as we all know, with the current restrictions, there's been a reduction in ridership. That, that can't be avoided. But I would add that we've seen steady increases in ridership throughout 2021 leading up to the restrictions uh, that came in before Christmas. And we saw the return of overcrowding on a number of routes. And this is on top of the overcrowding that we already experienced on bus routes, particularly in, in the inner suburbs, but uh, across the city uh, in areas that serve where essential workers tend to live and, and work. And that overcrowding never really went away, although the overall system ridership did uh, decline. So this is the thing that's worrying a lot of transit riders. And it continues to worry transit riders because we're worried that service might not be there once ridership begins to climb again in 2022. And I can tell you through personal experience that a number of service routes are still fairly crowded. So I think perhaps from the main problem here is that when we're relying on a quantitative analysis, it isn't really giving you the full picture of what's happening out on the streets. I'm not arguing against quantitative analysis. Of course, you have to do it. The numbers don't lie. But qualitative analysis will give you a picture of what's happening uh, on the streets. And this is the same thing that happened earlier in the pandemic when crowding persisted on a number of bus routes, uh, again, particularly in the inner, inner suburbs, that you know, didn't see the decline that the rest of the system did. And it was a problem. And this is compounded by the cuts that took place late in 2021, which were, you know, the announced reason was due to the vaccine mandate. And if we take that, explanation at face value. And even then, there's still no public plan to restore service before Q2 2022. And that seems to not have changed. So speaking personally, service quality on my local bus, the 63, is atrocious. Uh, it was bad even before the pandemic. But in November, with the cuts, I'd say re reliability fell off a cliff. And I've since moved from where I used to live before when I spoke to you guys last. So I'm no longer um, in Councillor Layton's ward, but um, now towards the southern end of the bus route uh, in Liberty Village. So you would expect that service where it begins on Atlantic Avenue would be even. It is not. Reliability has fallen off a cliff. And this is something that we're seeing across the system. So I mean, I, I'm seeing 30 minute headways on the 63 sometimes. And I'm not just counting that. You know, on a snow day like today or what happened on Monday, but overall since November. So a lot of transit riders are, of course, worried by these you know, service gaps. Uh, it's causing overcrowding, it's causing unreliability, and it's been worse since November. So I would say on the surface, looking at the 2022 budget, it actually does look decent. We're, we're seeing a bit of extra funding for the TTC, and that's welcome. So in a way, thank you. But the big worry for a lot of transit riders, including myself, is that not enough has been done to prepare for the next few months when ridership will be increasing as the restrictions ease. And we are calling on you, on you to release a plan to fund the TTC and restore that law of service right now or as soon as practical. Thank you very much, Vincent. Are there questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, seeing none. Thank you very much for your deputation tonight. Next is Tim Kokur. Uh, thank you, Councillor Crawford, members of the committee. I'm the executive director of the Waterfront Business Improvement Area. I'm primarily here to thank city staff for all their work in the past year and to highlight a few projects we're very excited to see on the waterfront soon with the city's hard work and investment. Uh, the electric ferries, we thank you 
very much for this year beginning to invest in the replacement of the four Toronto Island ferries to be fully electrified over the next few years. I'd also like to specifically thank the city's economic development and culture department, including the city BI office. For a number of areas, we've been able to partner on improvements. In the next month, we'll announce two new waterfront reconnect underpass pilot designs. These are test projects to create more friendly underpasses under the gardener, which actually act as gateways for people coming to the waterfront downtown. We've been cost sharing partners with the city on this project since the beginning, and I just want to highlight the importance of these types of cost share investments. There's now further investments beyond our BIA and the city's contribution to also come from the Downtown West BIA, the Bentway Conservancy, which is actually going to lead the design competition, and also the federal government as well, have all jumped in after the city and the BIA office cost share. So once the Gardner Rehab is complete through downtown, we're, our BIA is committed to continuing to support more permanent improvements in partnership again, hopefully with the city and those others to ensure safer passages to the water. With the city BI office cost share program, we're also able to work with Philanthropists this year who wanted to bring a Terry Fox monument to uh, near the Toronto Music Garden on the waterfront that will be in place this summer. Thank you again for the city's investment in that as well. And um, the most important project for the future of the waterfront is the Waterfront East LRT connecting the Portlands to Union Station. And that will be designed to the extent it can be eligible for full funding for the first time this year. City transit planners have done exceptional work recently, a new alignment the first phase of the LRT connects 1.5 kilometers deep into the Portlands in the first phase, which was not originally planned. This is critical because connecting the Portlands, making sure it's built out with transit is how you maximize the potential of what will be a massive new neighborhood for the city. The city is currently planning for 25,000 housing units through the Portlands, which would house about 65 to 70,000 people. And we know with room to increase density further in a number of areas in the Portlands, it will likely be 100,000 people will eventually live in the Portlands. We expect the Waterfront East LRT update to come to Executive Committee on March 30th now as one of the city's two next transit priority projects, along with the uh, Eglinton East LRT extension. That's in Scarborough, and since Scarborough is so well represented on this call, I should point out that that other transit project would connect uh, I UT Scarborough through to Melbourne going north. And um, the other way around, I need to highlight that um, it helps more people from Scarborough get to jobs in the downtown core and also to visit more parts of the waterfront. I, I know from uh, our own central waterfront parks, we know this year from some cell phone data we were able to just release with our um, annual pedestrian counts, we know that there were a million trips to waterfront parks. So that includes the Toronto Ferries and all the public parks along the waterfront. There were a million trips from people that originated in Scarborough, which is actually, we were surprised by that. It's about once you remove people that actually live on the waterfront, about one out of eight visitations to the waterfront which from Scarborough in the last year since the pandemic. Um, so we're very fortunate that with all the new parks and public spaces opened up by waterfront development, uh, they've created new recreation opportunities, not just for those who live downtown, but for those across the city of Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Seeing no questions, appreciate your time tonight. Next is Vanessa Conley. Vanessa, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Go ahead. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You've got five minutes. Excellent. Thank you. As said, my name is Vanessa Conley. I am a longtime resident of Ward 9. This is my third year in a row giving a deputation that seems to continually fall on deaf ears. City Council needs to defund the police. Full stop. At approximately $1.2 billion, the Toronto Police is the single largest municipal expense. And, and for the 2022 budget, the police are asking council for a $25 million increase, an increase over $1.2 billion. Over $3 million per day is spent on policing in Toronto and over $6 million in the GTA. And they still want more money. This needs to stop. Policing receives more money than public libraries, shelters and housing services, social services and employment, and community housing combined. They receive more than paramedic and fire combined, the very people that are first responders. I would like to emphasize first responders. Those are just some of the financial numbers that allow and enable cops to uphold a system of ongoing profiling, targeting, 
and violent overfleecing of Black, Indigenous, racialized, disabled, LGBTQ, and unhoused residents. Between 2013 and 2017, a Black person was nearly 20 times more likely than a white person to be involved in a fatal shooting by the Toronto police. As stated on the police service website, training for a new recruit is 24 weeks. Let's pause on that for a moment. 24 weeks. By comparison, a licensed mental health practitioner have to acquire a master's degree, which is usually about six years of schooling. A nurse, usually that's around a minimum of four years. So in a mere six months, the police training program covers defense tactics, driving, firearms, neighborhood policing, and investigative training. No mention of de-escalation training, no mention of mental health training, but sure, train someone to react to every possibility of a perceived threat, give them a gun, and send them into a situation where a person is experiencing a mental health crisis. As we know, it usually ends in death, as was the case with Ijaz Chowdhury, Regis Korczynski-Paquette, Jamal Francique, and DeAndre Campbell. At least City Council has aided in the development of the community crisis support services, but there are no cookies. And to clarify, the 0% increase last year is not progress. This is the absolute bare minimum. If these teams are already asking for an additional $8.5 million to operate, shouldn't that and more be given from the bloated police budget? Especially if the police have suspended their divisional crisis support officers, wouldn't that indicate that the police service needs less funding if they are essentially admitting this program doesn't work by suspending it? In the time I'm allotted, I'm not even able to touch on the catastrophic housing crisis Toronto is experiencing or the $2 million spent on the militarized removal of our city's most vulnerable population from public parks. A completely abhorrent response that none of you should defend, specifically John Tory. Social issues cannot and will not ever be solved through policing. Public supports are grossly underfunded and need to be prioritized. I'm going to call on my own counselor here, Anna Bailao, for all the times you have paid lip service by saying, and I quote, deep systemic change, it is time for action from you. And for the lot of you, I ask that you be imaginative enough to actually help people. The scope and scale of policing in our city needs to be drastically reduced and invested in the services that can actually help all Torontonians to a safe, healthy, and supported life. Deny this $25 million increase the Toronto Police is requesting and reduce the amount they get this budget by at least $25 million. Better yet, meet the demands that people have been asking of you year after year. Defund the Toronto Police by 50%. I yield any remaining time I have. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Seeing no questions, I'll move on to the next three. Uh, Riley vanian Pa, Alexa Volkov, and Leah Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz, I believe. Okay, Riley, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, yes, uh, my name is Riley. I live in the West End of Toronto in Ward 9. I'm a part of an organization called SURGE, which stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice. And I work full time, but I have taken some time off today in order to be here so that like Vanessa and many people before me today, I can ask you in person to defund the Toronto Police Services by 50%. Uh, between 2009 and 2018, Ontario police budgets grew by 34%. At the same time, spending on social housing went down by 8%. Uh, right now, pardon me, right now, three people close to me are struggling with homelessness. It makes me feel fucking furious and horribly sad 
when I think of how little I can actually do to truly support any of them. It breaks my heart that I can only give them so much and I spend a lot of time trying to think of how I can give them more. I feel powerless and constantly like I should be giving them more than I have the power to give them. As their representatives, uh, counselors by Lau and Perks and Mayor Tory, you are the ones who have the power to help my loved ones. Uh, members of the committee, uh, please stop voting to raise the Toronto police budget. Uh, please vote to defund it by 50% instead, and then move some of those funds to create enough permanent affordable housing so that nobody has to sleep in a van or in a crowded shelter or outside in the cold. Uh, the process will be messy and imperfect. We can't create a perfect plan before we've even started. Uh, but if you give us this opportunity, it will be worth it in the end. Thank you. Uh, that's my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? And next, thank you very much, uh, Riley, for coming. Next is Alexa Volkov. Oh, thank you. Good Go evening, ahead. Budget Committee. I want to thank you for hearing me speak today. My name is Alexa, and I'm a resident of Ward 9. I am calling upon the city to defund the police by 50% and redistribute these funds to real forms of community support and crime prevention including the provision of truly affordable and accessible housing, mental health and addiction supports, supports for survivors of gender-based violence, and more. I'm calling for this for a number of reasons. Firstly, because I understand that police do not stop crime, they show up after the fact. I am tired of the unquestioned belief that the threat of police persecution will deter crime. The best way to prevent crime is to address its root causes. Poverty, lack of housing, lack of mental health and addiction support amongst other unaddressed social needs. Secondly, police themselves commit an egregious amount of violence and this violence is disproportionately targeted towards black and indigenous folks, people of color, our unhoused neighbors, folks with disabilities, those facing mental health challenges and other, others facing systemic barriers. Even in my own life, which has been protected by race and class privilege, I've witnessed police make fun of unhoused folks to my face, I've had friends have their concerns disregarded or even mocked by police. And when I volunteered at a rape crisis center for several years, one of the first things I learned was how regularly survivors have incredibly negative experiences with the police and how important it was to respect their wishes not to interact with them. And importantly, beyond my own experience and that of my loved ones, I listen when people say that their communities are being targeted by the police. This is why I've come to understand that the police are meant to protect property, not lives. And you need look no further for proof of this than the events of last summer, where over $2 million was spent on police to evict 20 residents from a park. That money could have been used to pay their rent if the city really cared for their well-being. So to me, when you sit here and you disregard the many calls you are hearing over the course of the proceedings for defunding, I am watching you say to these people, to your constituents, I care more about property than your lives. And let's be clear, the people here today asking for defunding represent only the tip of the iceberg. While a lot of you have he here have paid lip service to caring about reducing police violence, you are not answering our calls unless you reject the Toronto Police Service's request for more funds and actively remove those funds instead. Defunding is necessary in order to take away the power that the police use to commit violence and to properly fund the services that actually matter instead. And I'll finish by saying there's one budget item in particular, in particular that's clearly underfunded, and that's the amount of money that's being dedicated to the provision of deeply affordable housing and a suitable shelter system. The fact that our wait list is 10 years long is unconscionable, and it is appalling that the shelter system was allowed to, de to decay to a point of complete crisis this winter, particularly when groups like the Shelter Housing and Justice Network provided such clear and well-founded guidance on a winter plan months ago. Defunding the police and providing housing so our communities can actually thrive, go hand in hand, and I hope you can come to see this. Thank you, and I yield my remaining time. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Next is Leah Ashkenaz. Leah, are you there? 
Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You got five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Ashkenis, and today I will be speaking on behalf of Earl Haig Secondary School's Eco Council. In the past few years, Toronto established and acted towards ambitious climate goals, but in order to achieve 2030 emission reduction targets outlined in the Transform TO Net Zero strategy, we need to think long term. I believe that we have an opportunity to introduce innovative practices that support our environmentally conscious priorities. One area that may have changed permanently with the pandemic is Toronto's use of commercial real estate. According to a COVID-19 business community impact survey, 65% of large companies in Toronto have made their staff work from home. Many may make this business model permanent. With this change, there is a glut of unused commercial real estate, but investing in vertical agriculture or growing carbon neutral building materials in this space could help Toronto build and become efficient with resources and funds while moving towards our net zero goals. Toronto relies heavily on shipping food products into our city. Strawberries are shipped to Toronto by truck from California. This is a fossil fuel intensive process and we could grow strawberries ourselves. Vertical agriculture in vacant buildings would reduce emissions from transportation and farming. Growing food with hydroponics or aquaponics is energy efficient compared to soil based farming with reduced consumption of resources, pesticide free food, faster plant growth and higher yields. Using unoccupied buildings to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions is an innovative way to combat the climate crisis. Growing low carbon building materials in real estate would be another long term green investment. Globally, cement generated around 2.8 billion tons of CO2 in 2015, equivalent to 8% of the global total. As cement use is predicted to rise with global urbanization, it's important to invest in low carbon building materials and construction techniques. One material is mycelium, a root from mushrooms grown on waste or debris. Mycelium is durable, carbon neutral, can be compressed into a brick or used as insulation. This resource offers opportunities for biocycling agricultural wastes into a low cost, sustainable alternative. In my school's eco council, we took an old canoe and built a pollinator garden, reusing an unused space and addressing an environmental issue. At a larger scale, this is the sort of change Toronto could invest in at this time of transition. In the aftermath of the pandemic, which affected every aspect of daily life, we have the opportunity to re-examine and affect radical change. Whatever we do and however we deal with this shift, Toronto should not let a good crisis go to waste. Thank you. Thank you very much and I appreciate you coming out tonight. That was great. Thanks. <laughs> Anytime. Um, seeing no question, well, there we go. That's how good it was. There was no questions. Definitely on point, thank you. Next three speakers, Rahul Singh, Christine Jelson, and Eva Shields. Rahul Singh is up first. Hi there, how's my volume? Your volume is perfect. Great, hopefully you reset the clock. My name's Rahul Singh. I'm the uh, executive director at Global Medic. We're a registered charity. We operate out of the city in Lower Etobicoke. We're a disaster response agency. We run about 240 ops in 78 countries around the world. We actually do a lot of domestic programming here in which we provide uh, response and assistance on food security, getting people hygiene items, and we've just opened a vertical farm. I want to point out a problem that's happening right now, and I want to get it on your agenda. The increased costs as a result of the impacts of COVID-19 are frightening. You're going to see many of our social service agencies lose their footprint and space in our city because of their lack of availability of space and their affordability of rent. Money that you give as council is worth about 50 cents on the dollar compared to what it had been worth three or four years ago because of increases in rent to industrial space as places compete against Amazon, as they compete against a Starbucks, as they compete um, against movie studios that are coming in. And last year, you gave money to 840 community agencies. They deliver the front line of your social services, of our social services as a city. We can't really afford to lose those agencies. We can't afford to have their footprint shrink in the city, especially with the impact of COVID-19, where you see the Daily Bread Food Bank Bank reporting a doubling of people accessing food banks. So needs are going up. Our ability to meet those needs is going to go down unless we intervene and do more. Now, the problem is 
I don't think you're going to have enough money to double out and pay more rent to agencies. So we're going to have to create an innovative solution. And we have a proposal for you at Global Medic based on what we've been seeing. So Councillor McKelvey was actually involved in something where the University of Toronto and Scarborough provided us space that we could come in and repack food aid. It gave us free space as a charity to bring in volunteers, pack food aid, and then get that out to the food system. Humber College had done the same thing. The city of Brampton has done the same. The city of Cambridge has done the same as well. In fact, right now, a company called Quadreal, which is a property development group who own the Cloverdale Mall in Etobicoke, they've given out 110,000 square feet to five charities, us, the Salvation Army, North York Harvest, the Humane Society, Furniture Bank. In fact, there's actually a vaccine clinic in that space. So what happens in this space is charities are able to operate, create furniture, which goes into part of the rapid rehousing program. Our charity, Global Medic, is repacking food, which goes into the food system. We pack hygiene kits. All this space is great for us to be able to operate, and the fact that we have it for free means that it's not impacting us operationally. So for the last 18 to 20 months, this program has been the ultimate pilot in what we're suggesting the city does. With your modern TO changes coming to the city, you're going to see that you're going to need a lot less space for your workforce. And in fact, we have a lot of buildings here in the city. So what we're suggesting you do is you create social impact hubs in strategic parts of the city. To start, I would suggest just using the buildings that you have that you will no longer use for your civil service and make them available to the larger charities and then some mid-sized charities as well so they can continue to operate. What ends up happening is you'll be a good steward of money because you'll retain the value of those buildings and the land down the road. Best case scenario, we solve global poverty in 50 years. You're sitting on great assets down the road. If we don't, those charities still get space to operate and to do good, right, to have the impact of what they do. Beyond that, those charities can create this culture of working together. Can you imagine one mega center where global medic volunteers can share space and be next to furniture bank volunteers and be next to North York Harvest volunteers who can then share trucks, who can then share logistics, who can then share all of the capacity they need to deliver more aid out to families in need. So if needs are rising and your ability to program money is not going to increase, surely the greatest way forward is to do more with less by innovating. We have an opportunity right now as we in the city start to downsize on a number of our buildings to meet these needs. And if we let this get us by, I mean, think of it, people are losing their homes, everything's getting more expensive. This will happen in the social service sector. We as an agency just opened a vertical farm and we couldn't do it in Toronto because of affordability. This is going to keep happening. This program that we're suggesting is a great solution. I'm hoping you'll ask some questions on it because this has had a proof of concept and it's definitely a way forward in order to meet rising needs here in the city. Thank you very much, Rahul. Other questions? Councillor Lai. Thank you. I do have some comments and just a quick question. I, I really appreciate uh, your comments and your deputation. I think it's really for a good cause. And uh, how many of these uh, centers you think uh, is uh, in existence now in, in Toronto, just at the city of Toronto? At the moment, Councillor Lai, there, there really is none that's sponsored by the city. Um, we were very lucky that the team at the Strategic Partnerships Office in the city had worked with Quad Wheel to make that one space open to the five charities, and that's in Etobicoke. My suggestion would be to put one up in the north and the middle, one in the east in Scarborough, and then one in the west in either North York, York, or, or Etobicoke, and allow big agencies to come in. And, and Councillor Lai, like Furniture Hub, these guys are great. They bring in used furniture from folks. They then rehouse people with that furniture. Their lease is up. Their landlord is talking about doubling their rent 
Mm-hmm. If they have to double their rent, they're going to either lose half their space or move out of the city. We can't afford to lose folks like that. Same thing with food bank. Could you imagine, Councillor Lai, if we could open almost the Amazon for aid in a 50,000 square foot space that you provided, whereby we could go to all of the companies out there, like the Procter & Gamble's of the world, and say, could you send us your hygiene items, perhaps that are short dated, perhaps that you know didn't sell during the Christmas rush, but you want to now move, and we can give them a way to vulnerable families that simply can't afford shampoo or soap. It promotes the notion of the circular economy. It avoids landfill. It does all the things that we want to do from a climate change perspective, right? And it makes us a stronger, more resilient community from the grassroots level. So right now, we don't have this operating, but we do because of Quadriel and then the city's coordination, and it's the perfect model. So I would suggest replicating it. And even if we didn't look at the one that was there right now in Cloverdale, the fact that the University of Toronto Scarborough campus opened up its gymnasium to allow us to come in and pack food and then pack hygiene kits and equip every food security agency east of Young was incredible. The fact that Humber College, right early in the pandemic, opened up its carrier campus, which is where, um, you know, the trades, uh, the students that study trades go. And of course, the students were told to stay home, so the space was available. And then we packed more food aid and took care of all the agencies west of Young. So the proof has already happened. Like, we're not coming to you with an idea. We're showing you something that's been working for two years, and right now you're in an opportune time because of this change in the way we do work, and this is just a much better use. The other thing I would say, Councillor Light, if you think of this more broadly as like a food hall, you know, think of ghost kitchens where landlords are coming in and opening up five or six kitchens, and then new businesses can come in and start up without the massive overheads of opening a restaurant. This is a similar idea, but the city would be the landlord in providing the space. And rather than us being restaurants, we are the agents of good that will use your space in order to deliver the good that we do. Yeah, I, I do actually, my ward actually did benefit from uh, from your uh, uh, your location at uh, UTSC, which I think you are you are really doing your your company is doing a great 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 job and good things. So if you can send me an email, uh, let me know, and I may be able to connect you to some maybe some private uh, enterprise, some schools or whatever. So I think uh, I think you're right. You know the idea is right there. We just need more people to be on site, and uh, and then we'll take it into uh, you know consideration. I really appreciate uh, your deputation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Light. Just one thing for all of the councillors, uh, Mr. Chair, I see there's just a minute left on that. We have submitted a, um, a pr- like a proposal or a document for you to, to review, which outlines the points that I've raised, gives you some links to some videos as well, and gets more into the nitty gritty and the details. That was submitted, I, I believe Giselle told me that it is now part of the record, and of course, I'll email that to you again as well tomorrow. Thank you. And that was going to be my question to you. If you had sent something into us, sounds as if you did. Thank you very much, Rahul. Um, G- I had Gary, couple... Gary, if I could, I've got a, I've got a couple. Oh, questions. I'm sorry, Council. I didn't see you. You were on my other screen. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I popped off to run the wash. No worries. Okay, Mike, your turn. Uh, Rahul, I, I don't doubt the merits of the idea. And in fact, there was a time not so long ago where the city had what we called below market rents (BMRs) in a lot of facilities. I can remember one that was both a, a shelter um, for Eva's place, as well as um, clay and paper theater where the tenants in another half, it was down in ordinance and, uh, and, and strong, you know, it stands there now. Five condominiums because the city of Toronto capitalized its properties and gave them the create TO and sold them. The city got some cash as a result, granted, very little in the way of city building and those agencies had to be relocated, unfortunately. Um, But that was one of these hubs that you're talking about. Now, here's the challenge, or uh, I'll phrase it as a question. Um, Did you know that as part of the modern, modern TO program, the city in fact expects to modernize and it's necessary, like we, people still need offices, in order to modernize our existing office space, our, our, the ones we're not surplusing, 
we need 250 million from the sale of the properties that we're putting on the block. So as much as I agree that the city should be able to provide the spaces that you're talking about here, we are never going to get there if we expect to get 250 million from the sale of the properties. Um, and I guess that in the form of a question that was I, like, I, I hope it doesn't surprise you or does it doesn't it surprise you. Um, is there anything, you, any message you would send city council before we just go ahead and sell these properties to modernize others? Um, because you put forward a great idea, but it's not going to pay the $250 million bill that we, we have out of necessity because we need those off. We need offices for our workers, at least for some of them. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And I will say this, the below market rent program was a good program. It wasn't a great program. Um, if you had a more robust program, like the one we're proposing, it would be it would be better. There's no opportunity for agencies with good ideas that are startups to get to any level of scale in the city because of this lack of space. Everything that we do in terms of social innovation or innovation or all these incubators and ventures is to to percolate and start an idea. There is nothing about scalability in the city or almost anywhere, right? It's it's terrible because we're missing out on that opportunity to grow. I would say that when is the best time to sell real estate? This is this is an age-old investment thing that my father would say to me, my mother would say to me, and the answer is never, right? So if you have real estate, use it for good purposes. Like you could you know, you could use these hubs or create these hubs and put, you know, low income affordable housing on top of them if, if you wanted to. But the hub space is absolutely needed, right? I would I would avoid trying to sell some of these properties. And I understand why they're needed. The nice thing of what we're proposing is we don't have to be at the corner of Avenue and St. Clair. We don't have to be at Young and Egg or Young and King. Like we can be out in the more industrialized areas, right? The problem is we're in this cash crunch now where for, for decades, the industrial side of properties in the city did not rise, right? From 1990 to 2012 to 15, there was very little movement in the prices of those industrial units, right? Anybody that signed a lease in 17 that's coming due today will have their rent doubled. It's just what's gonna happen, right? So you're seeing this massive backlash and, and I tell you, I'll be here next year talking to you about every one of the charities that you lost in the year after. And I guarantee you, counselors, every single day, a charity will call your office and say, we're about to lose our space. Oh my God, how are we going to take care of the people that we're helping if they're about to lose their space? So a pilot like this is just, it's an excellent model and a way forward. You know, in Scandinavia, in that notion of circular economy, that notion of um, community resiliency and putting agencies together, they took over a mall. The government took over a shopping mall, put 14 stores in that mall, and all they do is sell kind of used goods, almost that thrift model, just to avoid landfill. And they did it under um, a community reuse recycle program. So we just have to get creative in the way we think. We know we need these services. We know we've got to crush costs downward or we're going to lose the services. So please don't sell those buildings. We'll put them to really good use and we will help people in need at a lower price point. Thanks, Ronald. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Christine uh, Jeltsin. Christine, you there? Can you hear me? We, we can hear you now, yeah. Okay, great. So, counselors, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here because of Progress Toronto. My name is Christine and I live in Willowdale. I'd like to speak with you on the matter of affordable housing and uh, funding allocation to the police. A bit of context, I went to high school at Young and Shepherd at Cardinal Carter. I went to U of T for my BA. Despite all this, I still live at home with my mom. I'm 42 years old. 10 years ago, I switched careers and started working in social services in support of housing and shelters downtown. The irony is, of course, that I myself cannot access affordable housing. 
There is not even a wait list open for co-op housing. In the past two years, I've managed to get on the wait list for one co-op housing building, and I'm 46 on the wait list for a bachelor apartment. And that's not to mention all the other people that are waiting uh, for uh, housing with that Toronto community housing. We know that's a 10 year wait list. Uh, I'm an essential worker for the city, yet there's no housing for me to move to. The clients I support in the hotel shelter, just like you and me, they may have been evicted or lost their job. Some are working. It's not even a question of substance use or mental health. If I did not have my mother, I would be one of those people too. It's embarrassing for me, but more importantly, it's embarrassing for the city. Okay, it's embarrassing for Toronto. We have, you know, we've got two cities in one. We've got cities for the super wealthy and 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 the extremely impoverished. I can see that there are a lot of condos going up in the city, and Toronto is being called one of the best cities in the world to live in. But I have to ask for who. You're attracting young professionals to come work here in the tech sector and other lucrative sectors that are not even looking after your own people to staff all the services you need. To live in Toronto, renters must earn at minimum $60,000 a year before tax to live here. Frontline staff like me earn $45,000 a year before tax. It's above minimum wage. Now consider those at minimum wage or um, on Ontario Works or ODSP. I think more co-op housing or higher percentages of other rent geared to income housing is needed. I lament the fact that in Willowdale, there is very little affordable housing. We don't e even have zoning for rooming houses in Willowdale. I had the opportunity to live in Europe for a few years and there my rent for a bachelor's was a fifth of my income. Here, most of my paycheck would go to rent. I may need to move out of the city. Additionally, I'd like to address police funding. I applaud your decision from last year to put some funds into a pilot program for an alternative crisis response unit. That was a big step for the city, but I think it was uh, overdue. At this time, I think we should remove funds from the police instead of increasing it and divert that to more upstream solutions. I think more funding should be going into, again, housing, social programming, and recreation. We need to make mental health a collective priority instead of individual self-care and putting it all on us to do ourselves. Mental health issues are reduced by having proper housing, sport, and creativity. Right now, there's a huge increase in people with mental health issues and not just because of the pandemic. One only need to take the subway in Toronto at any time of day to see this. Every subway ride I take, there's always someone with a mental health issue there was this was not the case just a few years ago this lack of infrastructure that i mentioned is contributing to this so i ask you how is it that you say you have money for 25 million dollar increase for the police but you do not have any funding for housing where is the housing commission you have been speaking of for the last several years you say you're quote unquote working on it how can you take years to figure this out yet have no qualms about handing over increases to the police Without question, you have your priorities backward. Me and many of other callers are imploring you to not go along with the status quo budgets you have been proposing. You need a radical rethink. Why is there less revenue coming in despite this growth that we have with everybody coming to the city and you building condos? Well, yes, you need to look where the money is coming in. For one, you're giving the police too much money. Also, I think you need to increase vacant property taxes from one to 3%. They're very conservative. Also, I wonder if some of the answer lies in insufficient taxes coming in from big corporations that are housed here and big box stores like Walmart and even Shoppers Drug Mart based on the drug wrap up, theory. In, oh, sorry, uh, just one more minute if possible. Many big box stores in the US have argued they should pay the same property tax as other stores that have shuttered. Yes, they attract jobs, but they also get paid high profits and they must pay their fair share of taxes. Thank you. I know I'm over and I appreciate your time, but we need a radical rethink. Thank you very much, Kristen. Next is Eva Shields. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, good evening, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for all your efforts during this trying time. 
My name is Eva Shield, and I'm a mother of two young children and a longtime resident of Spadina, Fort York, Ward 10. I applaud the recent announcement of a more ambitious, ambitious Transform TO target. However, I was surprised that the release budget did not display the necessary funding required to meet those goals. I emphasize that the I empathize that the pandemic has created added financial constraints. The problem is that it is also apparent that delaying the necessary investments will prove to be more costly. I urge you to fully fund the actions necessary to meet our climate targets. I was compelled to debut today because of my two young children. As parents, we revolve our lives around our kids, make sure their lunches are packed, they go to their doctor's appointments, and they get registered for swimming lessons. But those actions matter little if we don't also protect the biosphere on which we all rely. In looking at the budget, there isn't much in the way of increased funding for climate action. In particular, transportation and buildings are, are underfunded by several billion dollars based upon analysis of the net zero strategy technical report. More specifically, I ask that you allocate funds for the following. Fair pass and rapid TO, ensuring recent transit, transit level decreases are reversed, electric, electrification of transit and the city's fleet, invest in vision zero and active transit and transportation to reprioritize pedestrians and cyclists over the car, greening of buildings and increasing the number of safe and affordable housing units. These are large amounts that likely need new revenue, revenue tools to address, but I stress that delaying will cost more in the near and long term. The pandemic has shown that the status quo is not working for many residents. Studies indicate that st cities consume almost 80% of resources and contribute about 60% of emissions worldwide and therefore have a very important part to play in the fight against climate change. We also know that climate change is a threat multiplier to our already existing issues regarding inequality. As council members in the largest city in Canada, you yield great power to make our ambitions a reality to make Toronto a better, more resilient and healthy place to live. We gain inspiration from other cities moving towards sustainability by interlacing greenery among concrete, creating vertical forests, ensuring that communities are able to travel by active transport or transit to get where they need within 20 minutes, and using technology to better route public transit to make it more convenient than a car. In conclusion, I urge you to share the vision of a more prosperous city by fully funding the Transform TO initiative. This means looking at new revenue tools to increase funding, particularly for transportation and buildings. We have a duty to protect the young people in our lives. They are counting on us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your deputation. The next three speakers will be Abdullah Nagvi, Grace Bannerman, then Earl LeBlanc. We'll start with Abdullah. Are you there? Abdullah Nagvi. Hi, how's it going? Uh, this is Abdullah. How are you? Yeah, we can um, hear you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Abdullah Nakfi, and I'm a member of Toronto ACORN and the downtown chapter. Uh, ACORN is a group of low and moderate income people, um, a community, uh, a union fighting for change. I'm here to talk about protecting and preserving affordable housing, uh, which is a top issue for ACORN members across Toronto and all our chapters. Um, housing is important to me because as a lifelong GTA resident, I would like to continue to live here and want to raise a family here. And it is it has long since become unfeasible. Uh, we don't want to turn this city into a playground for the wealthy. I don't think that um, uh, we should have a classist approach approach towards who is able to live here. I think that um, people who who want to live here and and love the city like I do should be able to afford it. Um, Towards working towards this goal, um, ACORN has the following demands. Uh, we want to fund uh, the rent safe program, more funding, uh, you know, the funding be increased so that 100 property standard uh, enforcement officers are on staff by the end of 2022. Um, recently, the city looked at licensing rooming houses across the city. And under the draft proposal, the city would have hired only 28 property inspectors for roughly 350 rooming houses. Um, rent safe has 200, sorry, rent safe has 28 property inspectors currently for roughly 3,500 buildings, which is, uh, you know, a, a ratio that is, um, unsustainable and, and unacceptable. Uh, the ratio of bylaw officers, the buildings must at least meet what the city proposed for rooming houses. 
Um, this could be done by adding funding from general revenues, uh, increasing the fees charged to landlords, and fining landlords for violations. We would also like to um, increase funding for the rent grant program, uh, a non repayable grant from the Toronto uh, Rent Bank uh, that's made permanent until the end of COVID. Um, so we currently have it going until the end of COVID, but we want to make it permanent because, um, you know, people being unable to pay their rent is not a COVID specific phenomenon. Uh, it's not a phenomenon at all. It's a thing that's happening every day in the city. And I think that it's important that, well, we as ACORN think that it's important that this be made permanent um, and that there is a pool from which, um, from which tenants who are unable to pay their rent be able to pull. Um, we also want uh, revenue from the vacant homes tax to be spent only on housing programs. Um, if revenue from, from that program uh, is being used towards things that don't help uh, people afford, you know, housing in the city or go towards housing programs, then it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, um, to have that program in place, the vacant homes tax. Um, we also, we also demand that new revenue be brought in by increasing fines for bad landlords. So our idea, our vision is for increased fines for bad landlords to fund, um, my, the aforementioned uh, property standards enforcement officers. So, again, not enough property for uh, property standards enforcement enforcement officers are on staff. We want to increase that to a hundred by the end of 2022. Uh, we want to um, make permanent the funding for the rent grant program, uh, which is a non repayable grant from the Toronto Rent Bank, um, and we want to extend that beyond the end of COVID which, you know, difficult to define, but we want to make it so that it's permanent. Um, and that kind of makes it easier to, <coughs> to define um, when this program ends, never. Uh, <laughs> we want revenue from the vacant homes tax to be spent only on housing programs. And we want new revenue to be brought in by increasing fines for bad landlords and that revenue to be spent on housing programs. Thank you very much for your time. And I yield back the remainder. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Next is Grace Bannerman. Welcome, Grace. So my name is Grace. I first moved to Toronto to attend university and I've lived and worked here full time for the past uh, five years or so. And during this pandemic, I've moved twice and lived in three different apartments. And key factors in those moves were rent prices and transportation to work. I'm deputing today with Progress Toronto to urge you to invest more than the current proposal in affordable housing, public transit, and food security, and reduce the proposed budget allocated to the police. So I don't own a car. I commute to work by bicycle. And the bike lanes installed last year on the Danforth and along Bloor Street made my life safer and less stressful at least twice a day, uh, and often on more trips. So that investment in green infrastructure had a really positive impact on my life. When it's not possible to, I depend on the TTC and providing funding to the TTC to increase service and make fares more accessible for more people, uh, starting with fully funding the fare pass discount program is vital. It'll make sure that people who can't afford ride sharing or taxis are able to go to work and grocery stores and appointments. Funding the TTC can get people where they need to go and advance Toronto's climate goals. So the second place I lived recently was close to a food bank and the lineups were down the block, especially on weekend mornings. And food banks are an emergency measure, not a long-term plan. And so the budget needs to more directly address the food security issues that many Torontonians are facing right now. While I was living there, uh, the building I was renting in was put up for sale. I found out when a friend saw the real estate listing with my address. Over the course of a couple of months, the building was eventually sold uh, and this is just a minor example of the uncertainty that renters experience. And I count myself very lucky that this transition was reasonably smooth for the people living in the building. I know many other Toronto renters, as we've heard tonight, are facing evictions or are having to put all of their paychecks toward rent. I now live in the Davenport Ward, uh, where one of the encampment clearings earlier this year starkly highlighted the affordable housing crisis and the disproportionate use of police that the proposed 2022 budget does not do enough to address. 
To put it bluntly, I don't want the city to pay to send armed police to evict people from their tents and take their belongings. We need more investment in affordable housing than what has been proposed. The status quo is not working. The status quo is leaving people outdoors today. And worse, the city is funding practices that are harmful to its residents. So I'm using the term affordable housing uh, clearly pretty broadly here, since there are a lot of ways to fund and implement affordable housing based on varying levels of need. So affordable housing for, to me needs to include people who currently don't have any housing. People who are people who are using almost all of their paychecks on rent, people who have to move further and further away from their friends, families, communities and workplaces if they ever want to own their own home and people who don't have the money to move out of the city if the rent goes up. So in the context of the housing crisis and this rise in food insecurity and with all of these pressures facing the people of the city, the amount of funding for the Toronto Police Services, I believe, is too high compared to the other social services and infrastructure that people need. I'm glad that the pilot programs for crisis response and community safety have been put into place, uh, but they need to be funded to succeed. So once again, during this budget process, I'm urging you to allocate additional funding to affordable housing, to the TTC, and to food security, and to reduce the police budget for 2022. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Next is Earl LeBlanc. Earl, welcome. Hi, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great, yep, go ahead. Okay, uh, my name is Earl LeBlanc and I'm a member of ACORN in the East York uh, Beaches uh, chapter. And as you've heard, ACORN is a group of uh, low to moderate income people fighting for change. And I'm here to talk about protecting, uh, and all of us, about protecting and preserving affordable housing, a top issue for ACORN members across Toronto. And why is this important to me? Well, I think it's self-evident uh, to residents in apartments, just to name a few reasons discussed in our ACORN meetings. For example, to bring things right down to earth and right into everyday living, um, our rodents and roaches in city-owned properties and other places, uh, private and uh, public. Uh, sectors. And I know this firsthand uh, from one apartment I've lived in, but also I, as a part-time job a few years back, I uh, did property uh, and rental property uh, inspections for a private company. And the problem is widespread and horrendous. Um, walk, another uh, important uh, aspect that seniors, which I am, experience in everyday life are walkways, for example, that aren't cleaned in the winter time. Uh, that's both uh, with the, on the landlord's side and the city. And of course, it's self-explanatory. It's important uh, for us to get out for groceries. And um, I also know, not only myself, but I know others in city housing as well, where they can't get out for very for basic things. I'm talking, again, older people, seniors, and so on. Uh, last, well, maybe not last, but we need assistance for students and seniors in the form of internet for all and affordable rent. It is quite clear to me that rents in our current economic environment are completely and totally uncoupled uh, from income. Like there's no relationship to, and I'll use myself as, again, as an example, I was rent evicted two years ago. And my rent has in escalated, increased by 40% on a fixed income and I'm on a wait list, but I apparently I have about six to seven, six or seven years remaining. So I'm sort of racing the clock, hoping 
I can manage until I get into, um, you know, a rent reduced uh, apart. Okay, as for ACORN, our current demands are the, of course, the rent safe program. And that in, entails that 100 property standards enforcement officers are on staff by the end of 2022. Uh, the city recently looked at licensing rooming houses, houses across the city. Under the draft proposal, the city would have hired 28 property inspectors for roughly 350 rooming houses, which is a totally unmanageable, not doable at all. Uh, Rent Safe has 28 property inspectors for roughly 3,500 buildings. The ratio of bylaw officers to buildings must at least meet what the city proposed for rooming houses. Uh, this could be done by adding funding from general revenues, increasing the fees charged to landlords, and fining landlords for violations. Funding for the rent safe program um, uh, could also be achieved by a non uh, repayable grant from the Toronto Rent Bank. Uh, and Have that... to wrap up, please. Okay. And uh, last but not least, a uh, new revenue brought in uh, by fines for bad landlords and also uh, tax increases, which are ridiculously low, uh, if at all, on um, the property management companies and the extensive building currently going on. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next is next three actually are Maria Christina Conlon, Vanessa DeWitt, and Nicole Anassis. Maria, are you with us? Maria Christina Conlon? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Five minutes. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you on the budget. I am a member of the Family Advisory Panel for Reach Out Response Network. Recently, I was invited to join its board. I have a long time interest in this issue as I was impelled by the 1988 killing by Toronto Police of Lester Donaldson, a black man living with mental illness. I am one of the community members who was grieved and angered at this. In my professional life as the Davenport Perth Community Minister, I was delighted to hear that City Council unanimously approved the creation of non-police-led response to calls involving individuals in crisis. In, the, in your June 2020 meeting, identifying four community safety and crisis response pilots. I was disheartened, though, not to hear more about this very important commitment. Not only has this commitment been pushed to the back burner, but we've also learned the plan going forward has no new money for implementation. New investments should focus on non-police interventions, not more policing. We want to see a clear growth strategy and measurements of success documented to the multi-year plan with enough funding to ensure that this pilot thrives. I am glad the first four pilots will hopefully be getting off the ground soon, but Toronto City Council needs to step up and keep their commitment to approve and fund the development of new non-police intervention to serve homeless people, young people, and others this year without more deferrals. Develop the multi-year plan with clear timelines to keep creating programs like Council promised this year without more deferrals. Ensure 
community involvement in how these plans and programs are developed and implemented in the communities they serve. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next is Vanessa DeWitt. Welcome, Vanessa. Mr. Chair, we've been advised that Vanessa DeWitt is not speaking. Okay, thank you. We'll go on to Nicole Anassis. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, you're great, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Um, you pronounced my name correctly, so thank you. Um, I'm here as a volunteer with Progress Toronto and I'm a resident of Scarborough Centre and I thank you for the ability to speak to you all today. Um, I'd like to take the time that I have today to paint a picture for you as this might further encourage unprecedented changes of our budget allocated to the police beyond the picture painted by statistics that we've heard uh, previously tonight. On Saturday night, I received a phone call from a friend who's experiencing a mental health crisis. My friend is a strong, intelligent, and very kind Black woman with a list of disabling mental health diagnoses, and she needed a ride to receive help. She called me because she didn't feel comfortable calling emergency services, and she was lucky to even be in the space where she could call for help. Her biggest fear is having somebody else call 911 for her. An anxiety disorder has periodically rendered her incapable of holding a job, as holding a job exacerbates her mental health symptoms. One of her biggest fears is that she will have a mental health episode at work and have 911 called on her. In May 2020, Regis Korczynski Paquette's family members called to get her help during a mental health crisis. And while I understand there's a lot of contention surrounding her death, I implore you to consider a system in which the most marginalized people of our city could feel comfortable receiving mental health aid from a 911 call without fear of escalation and without fear for their lives. My friend sees herself in Regis, regardless of the findings from the investigation. People uh, might find, police responded to a mental health crisis and a life was lost. I know that in March, there's a new team of Toronto public health professionals that will be deployed to respond to mental health crises. And because that's because of the demands made in the summer of 2020. The budget given to this new unit can be much more ambitious. Arguments against funding other response initiatives have been an increased need of trust for alternative emergency response methods, but the public already trusts nurses and pu public health workers. The budget increase for the police was justified due to the increase in homicides and gun violence, but people don't just simply decide to kill one another or shoot someone casually on a Wednesday. The roots of these problems need assistance beyond the reach and scope of the police. The city should be allocating the increase in budget to community programs, support, and affordable housing. Additionally, most of the calls police respond to are mental health crises, domestic violence calls, or other situations that social workers are better equipped to handle and do handle. My friend, people like my friend and my friend should feel comfortable and supported by the city to call emergency response units. Our city needs help and that is not in the form of increased police involvement. Our communities and our neighbors, particularly those who are houseless, who need the most aid, do not benefit from or feel comfortable of receiving aid from the police. And aid is in quotations there. <laughs> I hope you reconsider your support of the increased police budget that has been asked for. And I'm asking you to make unprecedented changes to emergency response systems for people like my friend who are disabilitatingly afraid of the police. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Nicole. Next is Lorna Weekend. Lorna, welcome. Lorna Weekend. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes, go ahead. Can't hear you now, are you still there? Lorna, are you there? I think we're having a bit of difficulty. Uh, I am here. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Lorna Wiegand, and my husband and I are right, uh, retirees living in a multi-generational home with our daughter, her husband, their two sons, and aging court, Ward 23. Today, I would like to share my story to illustrate the importance of increased funding and support 
for the transition away from fossil fuel-based home heating systems. Last summer, we decided it was time for us to replace our gas furnace with something more future-friendly. We wanted to do our bit for the climate emergency and help to reduce carbon emissions. We started researching government programs to help citizens like us take action. We first contacted the City Transform TO office. We soon learned that solar would be an unlikely solution because of our large shade trees and the orientation of our roofs. Our research told us that a cold climate air source heat pump would be the way to go, so we registered for an energy audit with the nonprofit Windfall Center in Aurora for January the 19th, 2022. Then on November the 6th at 2 a.m., our fire alarms went off. We had a serious house fire. Fortunately, all six of us escaped unharmed, but it has been a frightening experience. Although our insurance company is helping with the reconstruction of our home, they have no legal responsibility to help with the transition to the environmentally friendly changes we had in mind. After the initial shock, we began to think about how this fire might speed up our plans for, for switching from a fossil fuel gas furnace to an air source heat pump. But how could we get the required energy audit with boarded up broken windows and no electrical power and no furnace? We were sure that, like other victims of house fires or broken down furnaces in the winter, there would be assistance to do the right thing after our personal crisis. We wondered how many people in the city find themselves in a similar predicament each year. How could the insurance industry be encouraged to provide information about the homeowner energy loan program for homeowners who want to switch to cleaner energy sources? In the transition TO critical steps for net zero by 2040 report, it says that fuel switching and a clean electricity grid are the two most significant technical requirements for achieving net zero emissions. Somehow, I imagine that the city, maybe the province and or the federal government would create some sort of joint environmental energy emergency program. This would ensure that when residential rebuilds are a necessity, there would be immediate information and encouragement to support timely environmentally friendly solutions. Maybe there could be government partnerships with the home insurance industry and Toronto Fire Services. We are still researching how to make this happen in our own rebuild product process. I'm confident that if the City of Toronto Environment and Energy Division, and in particular Transform TO, had a larger trained staff, they could and would help address this problem for people under a forced timeline for reconstruction. For this reason, I am deputing today for the city to increase funding for the numbers of Transform TO staff to inform and support every Torontonian who wishes to reduce greenhouse gases caused by fossil fuel heating in our residences. No lineups, no waiting for callbacks, just fact-based advice and support from start to finish in the process of switching fuels. Again, in the November 19, 2021 Transform 2E, uh, TO critical steps for net zero by 2040 report, they list the targets presented in the existing building strategy. The second target reads that we need a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from existing buildings from 2008 levels. This means 100,000 buildings must be retrofitted in the next eight years, approximately 12,500 buildings per year. My question is, does the city keep a database to inform the public of the number of retrofits that are completed in Toronto each year? The report proceeds to say that existing programs need to be scaled up. I also believe that webinars and public meetings in multiple languages on the existing building strategy should be provided broadly across Toronto. I would like to give a recap of my two suggestions. Please increase numbers of Transform TO staff to assist more homeowners, homeowners and monitor and report publicly on the number of existing buildings in Toronto that are being successfully retrofitted each year. Secondly, please initiate conversations with your provincial and federal counterparts to ensure that the public knows about the home energy 
loan program help and to establish new funding streams to enable all homers to be part of this great energy transition. Thank you for this opportunity to express my concerns about how Toronto can reach our net zero targets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Layton has a question for you. Just very quickly framed as a question. I, I believe um, what, what you're asking for us to do with the federal and provincial governments have, has been captured in our transform TO recommendations. Um, and then it just, and here's the question. Uh, I think you've identified a, um, a bit of a gap in the federal, mostly the federal, because to be honest, the provincial incentives aren't really worth it. If you want to get off Enbridge gas, they're not going to give you any money to go electric. It's kind of a, a, a silly loophole in their work. Um, have you have you evaluated whether or not rebuilding to a like if you have to re you have to replace your furnace? I'm sorry to hear you had a fire. Um, yeah. If it's just not more cost effective to get a heat pump and an air handler rather than rebuild a traditional gas furnace, because it might be, I, I, I can say with almost certain certainty that it's probably cheaper just to go that route now. Um, that that you have a rebuild and that that may be why the incentives don't cover it. Have you done it like done a bit of an evaluation as to what the cost might be just to rebuild with um, with a heat pump instead of a gas furnace? Um, we're just uh, trying to select the um, construction company that will do the rebuild and we're also uh, consulting with Goldfinch Energy. Um, in Toronto, and I, I, if that's the case, I'm sure they're going to come up with with that. But I, I do feel that uh, it's a struggle that we're just having to solve ourselves. And I'm sure there are many people who give up and just get another um, gas furnace. Um, I can tell you, Trish and Sarah from Goldfinch will take good care of you. Might I also suggest if you're doing the if if you're getting a heat pump, there's a new hybrid heat uh, hot water heater technology that's zero emissions, that is a, a tad more expensive than on-demand gas, but zero emissions. And over the long term, um, it over the long term, it, you'll save money. And I can say that from personal experience. Okay, a hybrid system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Next three, <coughs> sorry, next three uh, speakers are Johan de Nora, Lokshmonen Puniya Morthy, and Michelle C. Oh, I can't even pronounce that last one. It's a tough one. C. Lokshix. You're going to have to help me on that one, Michelle, when we get there. Johan Denora. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. Uh, hello. My name is Johan. I'm a resident of Ward 11. And I'm speaking to you today because I'm concerned about the $25 million budget increase request of the Toronto Police Service. I'm asking this committee to reject this budget increase and to actively defund the Toronto Police Service, redirecting those funds towards services and initiatives that actually support community safety, such as affordable housing, food security, community and mental health services, with special priority given to the well being of Indigenous, Black, racialized, disabled, mad, and unhoused residents. This past summer, amidst a pandemic and an ever present housing crisis, Toronto made headlines across the world for the violent evictions of unhoused people from our parks at the hands of our police service. Photos, videos, and firsthand accounts of police destroying people's homes, slamming people to the ground, breaking bones, and threatening our most vulnerable citizens were what this city became known for. Let's be clear that the goal of these violent evictions was not to help people get housed. The majority of them are still unhoused. They are, however, not so visible, I suppose. That was the goal that the police served, removing what certain privileged counselors and residents considered an eyesore. It's shameful, it's horrific, and it's another grim reminder that the police do not serve public safety. Homelessness and poverty are the result of policy decisions at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels. No one needs to be homeless or poor. Our government maintains these vast inequities through its policies and its budgets. The money is there. This city council will give a billion dollars to the police every year Yet we've got decades long waiting lists for affordable housing. Council will approve $5 million for body cams, which as has been noted time and again, don't improve police accountability, but we can ensure adequate shelter space. 
Council will spend money pursuing legal action against a man making shelters for the homeless rather than use that money to support the homeless so private citizens don't have to pick up their slack. The city spent $2 million having the police evict those people from our parks. And now they want to give that same police service an additional $25 million. Is this really the best we can do? Why can't Toronto follow in the footsteps of Kitchener's A Better Tent City, humanely and effectively working with homeless folks? Would this cost anywhere near a billion or 25 million or 5 million or even $2 million? Why not take that two, five, $25 million and expand on the burgeoning success of the Dufferin Grove pilot, pod, pilot project, geez, which has gotten people housed? Solutions exist, council just needs to decide to pursue them. The unfortunate truth is I don't think this council will do the right thing. Their track record doesn't inspire confidence. We're in an election year. And to anyone listening to this, ask yourself, is this government really the best we can do? We've got a mayor who, in the wake of the highly publicized Lamport eviction, said he, quote, hadn't seen the footage. Those pictures were shared hundreds of thousands of times. The leader of the NDP shared it, for God's sakes. I'd offer that the mayor should ask the person running his embarrassing TikTok account to keep him better informed when his citizens' human rights are being violated. Deputy Mayor Manan Wong was against opening more public washrooms last year because it would, according to him, encourage homeless encampments. I'm not saying anything too original here, but what a disgusting thing to say. People deserve dignity, and I hate that apparently our politicians need to be taught that. Even our so-called progressives consistently drop the ball. Councillor Cressy had three encampments in his ward. Did he ever visit one of them, ever speak to any of the people living there? Councillors Matlow and Wong Tam tried cashing in progressive clout when they proposed defunding the police by 10% in 2020. That was almost two years ago now, and neither one of them has carried that torch an inch further let alone use the word defund. That goes for everyone, including those of you on this committee who sided with that motion and have since then put zero effort into it. Please do the right thing. Reject the proposed police budget increase, defund the police, and spend that money actually addressing the city's inequities. Make our city known not for violent evictions in a housing cr crisis, but for ending homelessness and supporting vulnerable people. And as much as I hope you do the right thing, I also hope that come fall 2022, I won't need to worry about a mayor who turns a blind eye or counselors with no moral backbone. Now I'm seeing I have some time left, so I do wanna add, I implore this committee and our counselors to approach this issue of defunding with genuine curiosity and humility. Defunding may feel like a radical idea, but there are so many wonderful, intelligent people who are doing the work, figuring out how to unwind this twisted system of policing and punishment that we've created and create an equitable society with a focus on real community safety. Listen to these people, meet with these people, and don't presume you know this issue better than them. Most of all, however, I'm asking counselors to be brave on this issue. None of you will touch defunding. You can barely say the word. It's painfully obvious that defunding is politically dangerous, which dissuades any of you from taking real action. Other counselors will blackball your motions, make your job difficult. It's easier to come up with excuses than do what's right, but we need you to meet the moment. You can't cower away from this issue. We, your constituents, need you to act with integrity and bravery on our behalf. Sorry for going over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions. Next, uh, Lukshmonen uh, Puniyamorthy. Lukshmon? Yes, can... We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, we can hear you fine. Yeah, you okay. go ahead. All right, perfect. Okay. So a uh, special thanks to um, Progress Toronto for making this happen. So hey, uh, so my name is Lakshman. I'm from Scarborough Centre. And uh, since I was a child, I've used TTC and I've grown with it. So I've seen my fair share of uh, delays as well as good trips as well. And since I have a car now, I've been driving more and I'm not the, using the TTC as often. However, uh, transit is still important for me and uh, many Torontonians to get to work. We have to look forward to the future because after the pandemic, obviously people will begin traveling again and we need, um, we need a transit system that will be ready for that. We can't be short-sighted and remove funding from this critical infrastructure, especially if we're going to uh, tackle cl climate change. We need not only to meet the demands of current riders, but also encourage future ridership and that happens with a consistent, reliable service along with a reasonable price so it doesn't make sense for me that uh the user f the fee for affairs is treated like a toronto zoo and uh it's used so often in our day-to-day -day lives and it's something that people can't live without 
Therefore, I'm asking council to adequately fund the TTC to maintain and grow the service as well as lower fares as much as possible so it's affordable for passengers, especially given that like inflation is eating up everyone's budgets. In addition, uh, the money that is going towards fare inspectors is uh, ineffective and it's better being spent reducing the cost of fares. It's, cru it's crucial that we look into this as public transit is the future. And with uh, Toronto's growth every year, we can't afford to fall behind. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Ms. Michelle Silochek. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Did I pronounce your name okay? Uh, Chiloschik, close. Okay. Get it right next time. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Chiloschik. I'm an artist and a cultural worker in the city of Toronto. I'm here to speak about the police budget and the redistribution of public monies across the city. Uh, and I'm here alongside Progress Toronto. I would like City Council to reject the $24.8 million increase to the Toronto Police Service budget for 2022 and reduce the existing budget by 50%. It might be hard to imagine, but it's possible and necessary to shift our approach to safety. Safety doesn't stem from weapons and aggression. It comes from taking care of people. Reducing the budget will distill the essential parts of policing and prevent it from functioning as a broad catch-all for all the challenges we face in the city. We need to redistribute the funds to programs and services that help address root causes of poverty, addiction, and mental health troubles. The police service deployed in all possible circumstances is just how to a hammer everything looks like a nail. Use of force is not appropriate in every situation and escalates already distressing situations. We need a tailored response to a variety of issues, hence the importance of funding alternatives to policing, such as pilot programs like the Community Crisis Support Service. I would also like my tax dollars to be put to work towards affordable housing. With over a quarter of Toronto real estate bought by investors with multiple properties, the housing crisis is spiraling out of control. Regular people without family money should be able to afford to rent or buy a house. It saddens me that unhoused people are so disregarded as shelters are filled to the brim, breaking out with COVID and generally unsafe. A bed in a shelter is certainly not a home. We need to support people with disabilities, ensuring that they can live a comfortable life and overhaul our mental health support system um, and addiction support. Housing, transit, healthcare, education, that's the path to safety. It's important to remember that police respond to violent crimes a small percentage of the time. What is most visible and traumatic of late is the humongous increase in militarized policing in reaction to protests over homelessness. Millions of dollars are being wasted uh, displacing people from one park to the next. It would cost a whole lot less to simply house people. My friend Kala was concussed at the hands of the police during one of the encampment clearings. She didn't deserve that. Most people are out of work right now or struggling to get by, and police should never be deployed to brutalize unhoused people and those trying to protect them. They're the most vulnerable among us. Thanks for this opportunity to share, and I please urge you to defund the police. Thank you for your time tonight. Last two speakers of the evening are Joseph Pierce and Greg Cook. Joseph, are you there? Joseph Pierce? Mr. Chair, Joseph is not connected. Oh, he's not. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, then Greg Cook, you'll be the last speaker for the evening. Welcome, Greg. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Cook. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Shelter and Housing Justice Network, and I work at Sanctuary, which is a drop-in uh, near Young and Bloor. Um, while while Sanctuary doesn't get any city funding, um, I'm speaking on behalf of funding for um, the 56 uh, or 55 other drop-ins in the city, and I know that 28 of them are get city funding, and I'd 
um, want to speak to that. I've been a, a drop-in worker since 2005, and in my day-to-day -day work, I see hundreds of people access our drop-in for basic necessities like food, water, washrooms, shower, medical care. Um, in the winter, warmth, we know that during this cold stretch right now that um, the number of people with frostbite has gone way up. And so drop-ins offer a space, a respite from, from the cold for the hundreds of people stuck outside because the shelters are full. In the, in the um, summer, they offer a respite from the heat um, in the form of a, a air-conditioned space. They offer, also offer a space for people to connect with friends, a sense of stability, a place to volunteer, um, among many other things, things like a space to get things done like taxes, um, make sure that they uh, keep getting ODSP or OW. Um, they're a vital resource um, for, for hundreds, thousands of people across the city. Um, as I said, there's 56 of them. And so um, I just really encourage um, the councillors, um, as there's drop-ins in, in wards across the city, whether it's South Etobicoke, um, Rexdale, um, North York, um, to consider um, adding 500000 to the budget um, in 2022. I think this is a, um, would be money really well spent and will, will literally save lives. Um, I'd also encourage you, one thing that I do in my drop-in work is um, hand out um, basic necessities like toiletries, um, and, and one thing that I know is in short supply and drop-ins across the city, as well as shelters, are menstrual products and incontinence um, supplies. And so I'd really encourage um, city council to consider uh, making sure that there's enough money in the budget. Um, I understand that it's only 185,000 that's needed to make sure that there's enough um, across the drop-in sector to make sure that people have kind of this really basic uh, medical necessity uh, to make sure they go about their life um, in a really uh, kind of dignified and stable um, way. So that's that's my uh, um, my deputation for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Seeing no questions, uh, I want to thank uh, you for coming. Mr. Out. Chair, Mr. Oh, Chair, yes. is, the, is the caller still there? Oh, yep. Greg, here. You still there. I didn't see you. Hi. Um, I just wonder because you, you're you're in an interesting position. You're advocating for drop-in centers that are that seem they get more directly uh, funded by us but i i heard from uh, uh, i had an appointment in my office with someone who told me that uh, um they run a an agency that provides food for drop-ins and yeah. through a technical change that we're making to our grant process they may be unable to to uh to to um successfully get through the grant process and so a major food provider to drop-ins will suddenly disappear and they're uh, they're looking to somehow be bridged until this can be be figured out but would that impact all the way to your to the drop-in center where you're working um it may i know we do um we get food from daily bread and um, um second harvest so i don't know which one you're referring to um so i um like I, just around well, this food is an security. agency that gathers from from all of the food bank associations and then delivers it um, packaged, uh, especially for drop in, so that it's it's uh, delivered in such a way that it 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 fits um, the the specific needs of the way it's distributed through a drop in center. I can't remember the name of the agency, okay. but I'm not but sure. uh, you haven't heard that it would impact your own. No, I mean I would say that that. Uh, the, the funding that the city does towards um, food security is really, really important, and, and drop-ins are a huge part of soup. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was just checking. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Like three to four oh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor, and thank you very much, Greg, for coming out. Um, I believe that was the last uh, speaker for the evening. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, wondering if I could have a motion. To receive the public presentations. Councillor Nunziata will do that. All in favor? Opposed? 